I'm so excited. I get to talk to Elizabeth Hamlet, Seven Steps to College Success, a Pathway for Students with Disabilities. Elizabeth, I was recently diagnosed with adult ADHD. I would say that I was surprised, but I know your work and it doesn't surprise me at all in a very positive way. Well, it's the thing is, I'm really good. Like, I love my diagnosis. <laughs> I do. Because for so much of my life, I I thought I'm dumb. Mm. Uh, I have every achievement. I just, well, don't say every. I don't like to use absolute. But most of my achievements, I felt were like miracles. You know, like something wonderful happened. I was like, like, damn, I did that even though I'm not that good. And imposter syndrome. Oh, most of my life. Most of my my life has been that. And then recently, I, you know, there's just so many things I want to do. And I'm so passionate, just like you are, about the work you do. And I hit a roadblock in terms of just wanting to be able to manage everything because things have gotten pretty big. And I said, I am tired of being frustrated and I got evaluated. Do, 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 you know, do, you, do you encounter a lot of adults with, with children who are taking advantage of services who, who, well, I think a lot of them have different learning disabilities or differences. Let me do this before you answer. Okay. I want to make sure I get the language right because I had yeah. to, because I was like learning differences, learning disabilities. I don't want to mess up the language. So tell me, how do I speak about this? So that's a great question. And it's a hard one to answer. There are definitely, definitely, pardon me, different thoughts about this. And so when I explain that I use the word disabilities consistently, I do that because the laws that I talk to folks about uh, that protect students and provide them with accommodations, you know, in K through 12 and college, um, are disability related laws. They are not differences laws. And so that it's a hard argument to settle. Um, but I want to be specific in saying that is why I use the word disabilities. I I also use it because I, I don't see it as a negative. I don't want it to be stigmatizing. Yep. I think that there are people who have sincere, you know, severe struggles. That's what a disability is. It's substantial limitation. Um, in everyday life activities. But the language is, see, I hesitated because I worry about okay. upsetting. I, I don't want to upset yeah. people because they're learning abled. They're, they're learning differences. There are so many ways that people use it in a positive way. But even in the offices, when I talk about, I get like, I get this weird feeling inside when I go, you have to go to the office of, of students of, with disabilities or the disability office, but this is what they're called, right? So it depends. Some of my colleagues use the words access and equity um, or accessibility, disability resources. So, you know, what I always say is like yeah. when I'm suggesting to people that they, which we'll talk about, look at the disability office site for each of the colleges that they're they're going to um, apply to that hopefully the algorithm knows. I don't know if it's the algorithm, so I may be getting that wrong, but like knows when you type in access or accessibility, um, or if you type in disability, that it knows that that office of access and equity is the one you're looking for. So uh, I think you can make as many people happy as unhappy, no matter what word you use. I don't know yeah, if that's helpful. I'm, I'm good. At, you know, all it does is, I think, reinforce the idea how confusing this can be yep. for parents and for students, because even in the short time we've been talking, you know, like, what do you what do you even search for the schools? And mm -hmm. I, I want to direct people to your website. Thank you. I watched your how to research college disability accommodations and other academic supports video. Thank you. That was a, that was a good video. Oh, good. That's it's you know look, I can give you some hints you know about that I you know and I ha usually have written posts for anything that's you know that I've created to go online. But I think sometimes just watching how to navigate through this stuff. I just did a workshop um, this week and I was going through a college disability services registration form. And even like knowing when you get there, what when you land on that page, what's the thing you click? If it says students, sometimes it's, you know, any student, sometimes it's students who are already registered. 
they might say prospective students. Well, to me, prospective is somebody who has is interested in the school. In some schools, it's whoever's applied to the school but not yet been admitted, right? Uh, or been you know, or been admitted and not enrolled yet. So there, are, like, there's all this vocabulary, and on my website. Um, I have this long, long, long post of all of this um, college terminology that we throw around all the time, you know, right. and forget. So like this this particular site that I looked at, one of the drop downs for the registration form said seeking degree. And there was a drop down master's, Ph.D., bachelor's. And I'm thinking, you know, I, I, I was on a scholarship board for 10 years and. So, you know, some of our students would not know what any of those words meant. No, the, it's so hard if you're a first-gen student or if you're a parent who's navigating this. And I, what I want to do during our conversation is clear up the confusion and, and make it a little simpler for students and also for parents and supporters, caregivers, whoever it is that's helping with students, just to be able to have some basic knowledge about how do I approach college. And, and I know that your expertise isn't in you know, college search and selection. But as someone who has been supporting students on campus, I know you have incredible expertise in understanding the challenges and how to be proactive and start to plan ahead so the challenges that you find students facing can start to, you know, you can start to work on them. And in your book, Seven Steps to College Success, a Pathway for Students with Disabilities, and I, and I highly recommend any parent, any student get this book. I don't know a lot of students that are going to be like, you know, running, reading this at lunch. I mean, it's fine. It's a wonderful book, but I think it's really designed more for for for, for parents and, and educators and supporters, right? Right. And so I have, and it will be updated. So we is it okay to say when we're recording this? Absolutely. Yeah, sure. Okay. So this is December of 2023, I think. Um, and in the next uh, in, in in this coming winter, I hope, the newest version of my six-page brief guide will be coming out. And so I didn't, I didn't get to send you one of those because I'm all out of the current one. But I actually think for students, it's, it's a better resource. It kind of like, here's your top couple of things yeah. to know. So I agree with you. I did not write this book for students. Um, it's wonderful if they want to read it. But yeah. uh, it's, it's more, I think... Um, I think often parents are the ones who are more active in the planning and 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 machination machinations. I'm going to make up that word of the of their um, students' education and students yep. are you know and not in a bad way, just doing it. They're just in that. Right. Education. Well, I think if you have a student who is dealing with some challenges and is just getting through their work, sometimes it's really hard to plan ahead. And I think parents of many of these students are used to filling that role. So it makes a ton of sense. Well, and I look, you know, I admire these parents. And as the book, you know, starts and finishes, it's it, it's I these are wonderful advocates for their for their students. You know, these are people who in some cases have had to really push for their student to be identified. That's not always the case, but they want their student to maximize their opportunities. And so um, the stuff about the laws and, um, you know, some of the other bits, I think, you know, again, that that brief guide, and I'll send you one when the new one comes out, yeah. uh, can be a better resource for students who, you know, have enough on their plate, just need to know the basics and move on. But, you know, not just parents, but I want professionals who anybody who works with high school students right. with disabilities needs to read this book because some of them are misinforming families. Yeah, it's a huge point because I get a lot of counselors, a lot of professionals, a lot of people in higher ed. So I look at you as, as really being you know, one of the top experts when it comes to helping students and families to navigate this path. And it's it's big. You know, I want to get back to, this is to sell my ADHD, but I started off talking about how, how I was diagnosed. And I think what's really interesting is, do you meet a lot of families with parents who haven't been diagnosed, who, you know, have made it through, but you, but you work with them and you're like, hmm, I wonder. So my, in my role, um, and I, well, I guess I sort of, I have two different jobs. So, you know, in one as a university disability, learning disability specialist, I have the privilege and the fun of working one-on-one -on -one with students who register with the office at the unnamed university where I work. And so because this is college, parents should know, 
Um, I have no contact um, with their parents. Now, I have a very unusual job. Not a lot of offices have somebody like me that students can see for free. So in my office, the person who serves as the student's liaison, um, my office are called coordinators because um, they coordinate student accommodations. Um, I don't think they have much contact with parents either. Um, so they might be better suited. But what I will say is, woo, 15 years ago, I used to do um, testing as part of a team with a neuropsychologist where I live. Yeah. And I didn't interface with the parents there either, except when sometimes um, parents were late dropping their students off for their testing appointments. Um, and sometimes I would observe that. But my colleague would say that sometimes, you know, he would talk to the parents and, and say, you know, have you ever thought about uh, <laughs> whether you and your student have the same issues? Or interestingly, sometimes when my colleague, who's a neuropsychologist, if I've not already said that, would say to, you know, the parents, look, here's what I've identified. And, you know, here are the students, you know, areas of, of weakness. And, and the parents sometimes you get defensive and say, well, I had those things and I, you know, yeah. I did fine. And, you know, sometimes it depends on who's defining fine. It's interesting. As you were talking about this, I was uh, I was trying to remember, I think it was in this book, it was in Adam Grant's recent book, Hidden Potential. Mm -hmm. They talk about, I think he talks about like the number of students who have, if, if, if a student has a learning disability, then most likely there's, there's a very high probability that right. there's a, a sibling or a parent. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and I think that just when I grew up, there wasn't as much testing and we didn't, we didn't really think as much about that. But it's really fascinating for parents because I know we're going to talk about students, but I think just as parents, really learning some of these tools if you're challenged and, and it can be this wonderful discovery because I'm just having a, I'm like having such an incredible time learning about me. It's, it's wonderful, it, Harlan. Yeah. It's, um, Attitude Magazine has amazing resources. I get, you know that one, ADD, Attitude, A-D-D-I-T, um, what is that again? Let's so everybody can hear. Okay, let me see. I'm gonna have to look it up because I am spelling it mentally is not gonna work for me. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> A D D I T U D E. Attitude like A D D Attitude okay. magazine. Um, I get their emails. They are a wonderful resource. They tap relevant experts. They're constantly doing webinars. Um, and just sending out a lot of really good content uh, and, you know, about being a parent and how to help your student, how to uh, college students, what they should do for themselves. And as an adult with ADHD, how do you manage your life? Great. Yeah. yeah, it's great. There there are so many. And I think also understanding that there's so many students and, and I know ADHD, it, that's it's one it's one piece, but just run through just some of the different students you you work with and and some of the the different uh, even this like i don't want to say the wrong word you know challenges or mm -hmm. disabilities so right. i say some of the challenges or disabilities that's okay i'm not saying anything wrong right no no, no. and i i do want to kind of be technical in saying that the reason i i emphasize the word disability is and, you know, look, there are more than 4,000 colleges in the country, and we all do things our own way. And so, again, to return the federal definition, um, stop the federal definition, the definition in the, in the two relevant federal laws says that, you know, an individual has to be substantially limited to have a disability. Um, and the reason I bring that up is that sometimes um, students come to college, somebody has looked at their challenges and decided it was a disability. Um, but it's possible and, you know, there are no stats on this, so I can't quote you anything that the college that they decide to go to will look at their documentation, which is a fancy word for the paperwork that they submit to us. Boy, I just got to get <laughs> done. Uh, so when your student has been accepted and enrolled at college, that's when they can or if you are that student then you can register with Disability Services Office. And that is when and to whom you would send your or upload your disability documentation. 
So for learning disabilities, it's probably the most recent testing you had for that. Um, ADHD is all over the place. Sometimes it's testing they want. Sometimes it's just a letter or a form. Medical, mental health, um, psychological, you know, uh, sorry, and uh, uh, physical disabilities. Typically, it's either a form or a letter from your doctor that treats you. Um, sensory, meaning visual and hearing. Um, sometimes they may need something from 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 a professional, but not as often. Wiping. Sometimes <laughs> uh, we will look at the testing for a student with a learning disability and not agree that it's more than just some, you know, a, a profile of strengths and weaknesses, which many of us have, but it doesn't come to the level of being a disability. So now someone who hears that and says, wait, Elizabeth, uh, my student has an IEP. Yep. My student has a 504. So my assumption is that wherever my kid goes to school, they're going to honor that because there must be certain laws that require them to do this. But from what you're saying, there is not a guarantee and there's a process. So so if you could explain that, I would be grateful. Yeah. And this is really important. So thank you for leading me into this. So colleges get to decide who is eligible for accommodations. Um, and that's why we have this registration process. Families should be aware, and so should professionals, um, that the student themselves has to register with us once they have enrolled. They generally can't enroll until they're in, um, but that process will involve, and um, I have a written post and a video on this too, You know, finding the process online, filling out our form, submitting your documentation. In some cases, there has to be an intake meeting. And there's a great video on my YouTube channel. A friend of mine who's a disability services director talked about that meeting and the questions he asks students and the ones that he wants students to ask him. What what video, just so if someone wants to find that video, and we'll include it in the show notes, a link yeah. video. Do you know the name of it? I uh, don't, but if you well, can't got it. it, I don't want to. Okay. You were in a really nice train of thought, and I, I didn't want to interrupt it. But that's all right. Just go back. Uh, right, register. So at that point, somebody in disability services will review the documentation the student has submitted and decide whether they're eligible, and if so, what accommodations of those that they requested are approved. So one thing that your watch your viewers have to walk away with is this. Neither 504 plans nor IEPs are valid after students graduate from high school or, in some cases, age out of the system. So can you repeat that again? Yep. Neither 504 plans nor IEPs are valid when students graduate from high school or they age out of the system. So what is understandably confusing is when you look at my work, you're going to see that I say uh, students who have IEPs have those under, and this is, this is where we turn into alphabet soup. An IEP, Individualized Education Plan, is given to students who qualify under IDEA, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. That act does not apply to colleges. And so while the text does not say anywhere, this means your IEP expires, that is essentially the effect. So then people say, but aha, Elizabeth, I also see in your work Section 504 applies at colleges. My kid's got a Section 504 plan or worse. My kid's school district, or I asked them to, moved my student from an IEP to a 504 senior year because I heard that 504 plans are valid at college because 504 applies there, and that is not true either. So subpart D is the part of Section 504 that covers K through 12. Colleges are covered by subpart E, and it is a vastly different part of the law. The demands are very different than they are for K through 12 schools. Um, and there are some exceptions written into the laws of things that colleges don't have to do for students. So if your viewers walk away with no nothing else, they should understand that colleges may ask to see their 504 or IEP, or they may accept it as a form of documentation, sometimes and uh, not all by itself. But it, even if there's 
they give students the same accommodations that were written into the high school plan, it's not because they have to follow those plans. It's because they thought the same accommodations were appropriate. And what's really important about that is I run this Facebook community and 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 I and I, I run it pretty tightly um, to keep people from asking questions and then answering them about stuff like this. Occasionally, somebody will try to ask, "What should I have put in my students, you know, senior year IEP or 504 plan to make sure they get it at college?" That's not how this works. So you know, nothing should be in a student's plan that they're not using. First of all, in my opinion, right, uh, and also just because it appears there, if it's not supported by what the student's disability is, um, if it's not appropriate at college, or if it's not something we have to provide, having it written in there is yeah. it doesn't mean anything. So, for someone who's listening and is now feeling a bit of uh, panic, okay, yeah, that's because because right. So they're thinking, you know, my child has really been helped. They've had extended time or they've had somebody who has helped them or they have certain learning needs that require some certain accommodations. So, so you know, there's there's that group where it's pretty obvious. Like this is something, you know, it's going to be hard to refute if you need someone to be with you to help you to learn uh, and be able to to participate in, in, the ed- in your education. That's pretty pretty clear, right? But like, is it not that clear? I mean, I want to make sure what I'm trying to get at is there are those students who maybe had extended time for test taking or maybe they had the option to be in a room by themselves. Then they get to school and they, sh- they say, here's what my IEP laid out. How could someone be more comfortable or what what are the chances that they're not going to have these these same resources? So I can't speak to chances. Um, I can say and 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 thank you for reminding me to to not just scare everybody and walk out of this interview. Um, we provide lots of accommodations and to a literally, you know, hundreds of students at a lot of colleges. So accommodations are available. Um, and there are a lot, and they are available across academic settings, across housing, across dining services, across any recreational um, opportunities that the school provides. So there are accommodations. Um, and as I said, for any kind of disability, um, years ago, a friend of mine called um, called me all upset because some college consultants had posted online stuff that they didn't know anything about, even though they claimed to have helped hundreds of students with disabilities. They said that uh, accommodations at college were really only for students with, you know, what we call physical or evident disabilities and not really for students with uh, what we call, um, oh gosh, somebody used a new term I really liked They in place of invisible, but uh, non-apparent disabilities. Oh, nice. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so um, they were wrong. Uh, and there, look, folks, there are lots of people offering advice out there who do not know of what they speak. Um, so what is, you know, the ultimate challenge of my work is trying to help people figure out who knows what they're talking about and who doesn't. And, you know, there's just lots of people out there who just assume that they know how things work and then put stuff up online that's wrong. So, but when it comes to wanting to help people, when it Mm -hmm. comes to... When it comes to a family or a student who who's really benefited and they need these resources, is it is it most likely that they're going to get those resources? I mean, how often are you drawing that line where a family says or a student says, "But but this was so important to me." Uh, the problem is, you know, I really, if I'm going to opine about how likely or unlikely, I generally like. To, to know that there are statistics to kind of inform my opinion. So um, my guess would be that that is that that most students who um, request accommodations are found eligible. Um, you know, colleges vary in how much they weigh history. So for instance, if somebody's sort of on the line, we're not really convinced we might accommodate because they have a history of being accommodated. Um, so I, I don't want to scare people and I apologize. I keep not saying this clearly. I would think that a lot of students are going to be just fine. 
And they're going to find a lot of these very basic accommodations like extended time. Now, you said in a private room, they're probably not going to get tested in a private room. Um, right. And this is where the vocabulary um, comes up. And, and again, I have a different vocabulary blog post about terminology we use in disability services that kind of helps to illustrate these differences. So um, we don't say unlimited time to take an exam because then a student could say, okay, I need five days to take every exam. And we're going to say no. To that. So um, it will probably be what we call a reduced distraction site of you and fewer classmates and probably a proctor. Um, you know, so those kinds of things happen there. And there are lots of different kinds of things. And if you remind me, I will try to send you for this workshop I did on Tuesday. Um, Portland State University um, has on their registration form this checklist of accommodations. And so people can just get a really good basic view of what is possible just from looking at that. And that's a great way to find out what's out there is to check some, it doesn't have to be a college you're going to go to, but if you just do a search for accommodations, university, disability services, um, to just see whose sites kind of give you that that list. Yeah. So just to be clear, if somebody has an IEP or a 504, there is a strong likelihood that the school, the college they're going to, if they have those resources would accommodate that student. I would think so. But again, you know, probably a bunch of people watching this will, you know, will say, oh, but I know somebody who didn't. So I I just don't have right. that for you. Right. And um, I don't want to, I don't want to have you, I don't want to make you say things that, I, you know, I can tell in our conversation, see what I really like so much about talking to you, Elizabeth, is I can tell you've had difficult conversations with people. <laughs> uh, it, it, it is It is so apparent to me because there's parts where you communicate in a way that is very much following the letter of the law, which mm -hmm. leaves very little room. And then there's and then there's that other part where, you know, you want to, I think what's so important about you is you want to help, right? Like you, you want people to get the, the resources they need. Absolutely. And I, and I want to be responsible too. Um, and it's interesting because, um, Somebody in my field recently misunderstood about my Facebook group and thought it was actually for um, like that it was for the parents at the university where I worked. And, you know, those can be, as you know, <laughs> very problematic groups. Yeah. Um, but what I said in response after understand they didn't understand that it's just for anybody who wants to find this. And, you know, my goal in this group is to provide the facts and to provide the nuance that I can. Um, with my knowledge about things like who gets extended time for papers and projects because it's not who most people think and not the same circumstances. And we can circle back to that. But I never want to be the person who, upon hearing me or reading my work, somebody decided not to register. That's a huge responsibility. Yeah. So, you know, I always want students to register with our office and I always want them to ask for what they think they need because there's a very good possibility they're going to get that. Um, what I'm trying to do, and I and I try not to be a Debbie Downer, is just to to be sort of you know straightforward about the fact that this is a shift, um, that things can be different. I would assume thousands and thousands of students go to college every year and they get what they need and they're successful. But I can just tell the the research in our field is a huge problem, meaning the lack of research in our field is a huge problem. So I, I just, I, I like to lean on numbers because I think they're objective and they at least give some shape to when I say frequently or not. And let me point this out, Harlan. When you get to the appendix, um, there was that big longitudinal study that I discussed and what percentage of students did not even register for accommodation. So that's actually a whole different conversation. Yeah, it's, and, and the book is really wonderful, Seven Steps to College Success. And I actually really enjoy, lately I've been kind of geeking out over over additional resources in the appendix because I find when you have all the citations and, and you have the links and the resources, it really gives someone a roadmap to be able to work through some of these questions. And it's shocking to me that there's such a, such a lack of research and data 
because we know there are so many students, more so than ever before, that are dealing with not just the apparent challenges, but those those ones that you said less apparent, not apparent, and not apparent. I think was the term. Yeah, not, not apparent. It's it's remarkable, and I think that 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 makes me really um, like that makes me incredibly uncomfortable because yeah. we know that there's so many students who are dealing. Because in my world. You know, like I, 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 well, I could look at the stats from the um, American College ACHA NCHA data, and I see the American College Health Association, National College Health Association. They do this survey every six months, and we know that more than half of students experience loneliness. Um, you know, a third are dealing, maybe a quarter to a third. You, it all depends. Are, are dealing with a lot of big mental health challenges, and a lot of those challenges, I would imagine. Could be, uh, could be, could be issues and challenges that students could then share and register for services. Let me ask you this: We got a lot of things to talk. This is this is great stuff. And I know we'll have to do we'll have to do like a Q and A in the fall. I would love to with families because I've got three questions that are swirling around my head. Okay, so we'll get to all these. One is, how do I know as a parent and a student what schools are going to be more friendly when it comes to accommodations and have those resources. Cause I think it's really important to be able to kind of just like poke around a little bit. And I know you do that in your, in your video, but I want to, I want to address that. I want to address the part you said about the test taking about that being different and, and having, I think you said that that would be, that would be different. And then I wanted to address if you're a student who's on campus and we know so many students are diagnosed with so many different types of, of, of diagnoses, you know, sometimes I, I always want to have the right word. So think about, it. I never could find that. Anyway, we know that sometimes between the ages of 18 and 21, there can be a, a lot of issues that will come up, a lot of mental health issues. Yeah. And those are, if those were present in high school or at least documented, they would warrant some sort of accommodation. So it's a student who doesn't know, who's diagnosed a little bit later, that they have something that is creating challenges in their lives. So the question of how quickly can a student get help to accommodate their particular issue uh, or challenge? Because I I want to direct students to that too. So we're giving you a few things. And you can you can you can decide what order you want to go with this, but maybe maybe let's do this. I said you could decide, but I'm I'm on the fly here. Can you address the last part? The students who get to school, okay. something happens, mm-hmm. and they're like, "Oh no, you know I'm so far behind. I'm so I don't know what to do." And a family and a parent's like, "I don't know what to do." And the kid's like, "I'm going to talk to my professor." And the professor's like, "You know, life sucks. You got to deal with it." Uh, how how does or the professor is accommodating because they're kind but when it comes to your office and a student being able to access those resources how does that work and how quickly can they get access so okay so <laughs> uh, uh, i know it's a, i i fine let's see what happens <laughs> uh, <laughs> sorry elizabeth that's all right. you know, uh, you know so much why i well i i don't do that I have a disability. My working memory is absolute garbage. So that's why I take a lot of notes. That is my strategy. I do that too. Yeah. Dealing with my poor working memory. So I actually have to break that down a little bit because Please. what's really important to know for parents of current college students is that most colleges, there is no testing available for learning disabilities. Um, now, what may be possible is the so you you specifically mentioned mental health, um, which is how I generally refer to psychological um, uh, disabilities. I don't know why I like the word health in there. That's just my own preference. Um, but psychological disabil- disabilities, yeah. um, it's possible that going to the counseling center might they might be able to identify if you don't like the word diagnose, um, which some people don't. Whether you know determine whether or not the student is you know just having. Uh, a, a depressive, um, I forget what they call it. It, it, there's an expression for that, but like it's just depressed right now, but doesn't really have like general depression. Um, 
or anxiety of or something you know specific situational anxiety um or something like that so if that is available then the student could approach the disability services office um and ask if there are accommodations now keeping in mind that accommodations have to be tied to you know how the disability is affecting the student so it's not obvious to me in this example of depression for instance what it is about depression that would make a student need more time on exams well they so, can't they can't uh they can't focus there they can't work because they're they're dealing with you know what whatever what they they just can't do it because they're their brain isn't allowing them to get the work done, so they need an extension. Okay. So, well, and there's a difference between in-class, you know, exams. So we might, again, if the student can make an argument and the, the documentation that's been provided shows that it is truly impacting them in this meaningful way, that student might get the extent of time for exams. Um, they might get, again, accommodated in a room where distractions are reduced. Um, so it all depends on who right. works at the disability services office um, and how they how they view these things. And again, they might require um, it, some schools that might require objective testing to demonstrate that actually, as compared to their peers, they do work more slowly because they are coping with, you know, the, the right. distractibility that the observer, when will we get a good report that the person who does the testing observes that, you know, they asked you a question and and you were already off, like, you know, and, and had to be redirected all the time or got halfway through. So so that's the first piece is just how do you get there, right? Right. And then once you get there, it all depends. Some of my colleagues can do your review and be ready to talk to you about, you know, what next steps within 24, 48 hours. Um, again, just looking, I think it was Portland State, it might have been um, Oregon State at Hood, um, their site said two to four weeks. Um, but I want to bring something else up, Harlan, and this is discussed also in the research in the in the appendix. Um, accommodations alone are not going to be the key to success. They are one of many tools students have to use. So things that you talk about in your videos and your book all the time. You have to go to class. You have to seek help if you don't understand what's going on. You have to spend time doing the work. You have to do the readings. You have to do all the things that a student, you have to get enough sleep. You have to eat well. You have to watch out for drugs and alcohol and not to say you're not going to do any of it, but like don't let them take over your life. And so they are an important tool. But all of this other stuff matters too. Yeah, the the student who has a you know gets in a car accident, a student yeah. who's diagnosed with an unexpected or has has an unexpected you know health issue, not a mental health issue, but you know we don't have to go through the list, but they have to have treatment. Mm -hmm. um, how does that work? So the you know certainly these offices serve students with temporary disabilities. You broke your leg. We might you know um, have. Uh, I actually don't know what they do for students. Mostly they have to hop around campus on on uh, on their on their crutches. Um, I'm sorry. And the other example was the um, they're being treated for some sort of, of disease or something. So that's where it gets tricky. So um, again, back to this website I was viewing the other day, they talked about what's called flexible attendance and a flexible deadlines on the same page, which is something that was interesting to me. So there, in most classes, there's going to be a certain number of absences past which the student is just not really in the class. And they, by this, by the way, is not legal or medical advice, nor should be, and should not be viewed as such. Right. But from being in these online communities with people who deal with more issues than I do in, in the, the kind of, you know, job I have. So a student who needs, you know, whether it's mental health treatment or treatment for cancer, like, shouldn't expect that, or probably won't be accommodated with missing 90% of their classes for the term. Um, there are uh, reasons why professors require uh, 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 attendance. 
Um, and so they may have to take the term off if they really have to be in treatment and be missing classes all right. the Right. And, and I think in these situations, the departments tend to be very sympathetic. I mean, I, I've talked to so many students and they talk about how everyone rallies around them. And, and I think that, you know, presenting it that uh, th this is one piece of mm -hmm. much larger holistic approach. And I think a school, how a school approaches this, like I do some work with Ferris State University. I don't know if you know Ferris. I, I, I know of it. I, there was a colleague who, who's not there anymore who used to be active in our community. Yeah, Ferris is great. I mean, like I, I know a lot of the leadership there and they work so hard to accommodate students. I mean, they are phenomenal and they have such big hearts. And mm -hmm. that's that's what I've found with most, with, with most schools. So when a parent or a student is starting to, to look at schools, are there resources that you like to direct them to? Are there certain places you think they should look at on the website? Are there questions to ask on a tour that can help them to kind of be like, oh, this is a school that's very, you know, th this is a school that's going to be there for me, or, or this is a school that, you know, might be trouble? Okay. So I'm going to go, I'm hoping that I will again demonstrate that, the, you know, that I, I talk to people about a lot of challenging things. Um, so... First of all, I think that students should compose their list by going with all of the things that their tip that their peers would want for a school, because um, in the end, often you're going to live there, and it has to be a place that suits you in all of those ways. The size of the community, where the community is, is it closer to home than you want, or you know, too far away from home? Um, you know, class size. Um, it can be very different. Does it have a lot of introductory level, you know, 100 student lectures or do they, you know, have they made a, a, an effort to make those classes smaller and, and a little bit more um, personal? Um, I highly recommend any student look at the graduation requirements of their college. So I have uh, two young adult college grads um, and one went to art school and one went to engineering school. And so I went to a liberal arts college where I had to meet all of these core requirements and my kids did not have to do that and were delighted not to have to do that. And so that should be part of a student's decision. You know, what is this college going to make you take? Do you want to take it? Um, and are there other colleges that have a curriculum that you like better? Because again, you got to do all that stuff plus your majors. So um, I think, first of all, <laughs> be, I, 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 admissions people are wonderful. I would not ask them disability related questions unless you just can't find our office or would like a personal introduction. Um, the cautionary tale, and it's just a single anecdote. Um, is that when I wrote my first book, I spoke to a parent whose student asked an admissions person about how hard it was to get uh, a, sub a course substitution for foreign language at that school. And that person said it was no big deal at all and was 100% wrong. It was a very big deal. Um, and it was a real struggle for the students. So come right to the source. Let me address the myth. Um, first of all, the myth that colleges are looking to screen out students with disabilities. Um, you can hear directly from admissions deans in step six. Um, and if you don't believe me or them, talk to any, any admissions dean. Um, they are not looking to rule students out. That is not. And um, you're familiar with Rick Clark and the Georgia Tech blog. I mean, he writes and, and does so much wonderful work of talking about how they compose classes and that that's not even a consideration so all this is to say call our offices ask all the questions you want students we do not get off the phone and you know we we don't take your name and your phone number and somehow you know contact admissions and tell them you're there because there's this whole agenda we're all in on that um, we're not going to accept uh, students with disabilities. And if this makes you feel better, I want you to think about this. If I work in the disability services office, even if this were happening, why would I ever actually follow through on that? Because if they don't accept students with disabilities, I'm out of a job really soon. Right, right. You need, you need students with, with needs so, yes. that you, so that they need you. There's a reason to be there. Get up in the morning. So I... 
So. And I don't, I don't at all want to be dismissive of, of students and their families who fear this stuff. They're being fed this fear by people who say things like, never mention your disability. Um, the opposite of what we talked about yeah. is I have seen people online say, get your kid off the 504 and IEP before they start high school. Because people think, I know. So first of all, they don't understand what transcripts can and cannot say. Um, and again, Car Harlan, I can send you the link to the Office for Civil Rights um, post on on that and what what transcripts can and can't do. Um, so they think they don't that include they don't include the five hundred four. They don't include the IEP. Like legally, they don't include that. Just so everyone knows, like some of the bullet points. Thank you. Yes, I should have probably actually explain that. Right. The only thing they're allowed to say is if your student took a class where the curriculum was modified. So that could be a gifted class. Um, um, and it could also be a, a, a class just for students um, in special ed who have more intensive needs. So that's the only thing it can say. As you know, if your student's taking SATs or ACTs, they're not allowed to flag the scores of students who used accommodations. So um, all of this is to say, don't take your kids off. Don't let your, you know, let them go without services or accommodations that they need. Um, and I want to also address something that parents have told me, schools have said to them, which is we should get your student off of any accommodations in high school because they won't have them at college. Now, it's true that there are some accommodations that they're unlikely to get, but those educators should talk to somebody at one of our offices better yet, read my book, um, or do both. What am I saying? Do both. Um, and, you know, find out what we actually do offer so that they are not misleading families and having students do without things that they should. Yeah. I could imagine the level of frustration when you have a parent who is so connected and such an advocate for their, for their child who has to hand them off and they've been told information that isn't in alignment with what's, with, with the reality. Mm-hmm. I'm sure that's emotionally jarring as well because you and, have expectations. Right. And so that is part of the raison d'etre of my work too is, you know, um, in my previous job in the early 00s, I worked at the State University here in New Jersey and I was seeing students um, requesting things that we did not do. Um, and it's not just that we, where I worked and do, that just aren't um, required of us. So um and they wanted, like I said, a couple of days to take a test or to write a shorter paper or to not have to take a certain kind of test, you know, to take, I can't do multiple choice tests. I need to have a fill in the blank. I must have a memory aid or word bank. Um, so I understand that that's, that's challenging. Um, so what it means is, to me, the best possible preparation for students who want to go to college is to, you know, move through high school, building the skills that they need and giving them practice, doing all the things that their that their peers are doing, because it's extremely likely that that's what they're going to have to do. Yeah. You mentioned that a parent can call or they can visit or a student could call, because I think that's really important. So I think sometimes people are intimidated or they don't want to inconvenience you or they don't want to be identified. But that's a common practice for a family member to call and say, I have a student and this is their profile. Can you just give me a sense of if you think this would be a good fit or you know, what, what accommodations are available? Right. And so, you know, listen, I'm a big uh, believer and promoter of students doing this research. And I've had parents say to me, well, but, you know, he's so busy doing X, Y, and Z. I think that there can be a balance. You guys can split up the college list and you do a few of these calls and your student does a few of these because to have them completely removed from this yeah. is removing their opportunity to learn the self-advocacy, to learn to articulate what their needs are, to learn you know like like you and i did for this call how to prepare for a call it needs to start early yes yes it does and so parents get, look i don't expect students to just out of the box know what to do but that's why you have the students sit with you you model it you guys work together on you know a list of questions you show a student you know you can give them some words to start a conversation hi my name is elizabeth i'm a junior and i'm looking at colleges I'm wondering if I can ask questions. Now, 
Here's where it gets tricky. And you asked me about what should students be looking for to figure out if a place is friendly, et cetera, and so on. It is such a layered, nuanced, complicated thing. And so if I took 100 students um, registered with a disability services office, I bet 50 would say they were well supported and 50 would say they were not, or that that ratio could go in either direction. And it's so dependent upon what a student wants and what they're getting. And also, you know, what's sometimes challenging is you may not know that the person that you're speaking to, meaning other parents, other students who say, oh, you know, Hamlet University's Disability Services Office really stink. What you may not recognize is those people had um, really unrealistic uh, expectations for what my office would do. And so when I said no, they, oh, Hamlet University right. stuff stinks. So you got to be careful about that. Um, and also some of these are one person offices, so they may not be able to stop what they're doing and 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 get back to you, you know, like if you leave a message or you, you know, talk, do it right then. You may need to make an appointment. They may ask you to send an email because it's easier for them to respond. And this doesn't mean that they're not nice, wonderful, helpful people who can't who won't right. be a good match. It just means that these are the strictures of their job. How about on a tour? Uh, stopping by the office saying I'm gonna be coming to campus, I would love to drop in. Yeah. So again, please call ahead and make an appointment. Um, they may be busy with the students they're already serving and may not be able to. And it doesn't mean that they wouldn't be wonderful you for you. Excuse me. Um, and, you know, and as I talk about in the book, too, I, I see people saying like, well, if they don't pass the disability services office on tour, I'm not going, you know, and that's a flying decision. Whatever decision you want to make that as long as you made it, yeah. I think that's great. Parents sometimes will say that to me. And here's what's tricky. Um, where I work, we are not on the main part of campus. We, it's, it's a very, it's, so I don't think it's on the tour, but it doesn't mean it's not a good office. Yeah. And, you know, think about all the different groups that might want their center acknowledged. The LGBTQ center may not be on the, you know, on the tour just because of where it's located. And sometimes it's not located in the center of everything because maybe they expanded that office and the space that was available was somewhere else. Right. So don't take too much away from those tours. That's that's good to know. And in the book, I have a bunch of I have a bunch of uh, pages dog-eared, but I want people to go through this. And when you go through it, you're going to see the different steps, and it starts. It starts, you know, before you get to college and just understanding your students' rights and developing the not academic skills, which we talked about, really being able to be a self advocate, work through your challenges in high school, not of a parent a parent needs to help, but really directing them and guiding them with language and and practicing. Uh, because they're gonna be the ones who need to advocate for themselves once they're once they're at school. Developing the students' academic skills, identifying colleges that are a good fit applying for college admissions, and then requesting accommodations. So within each of these, and I'll just throw a few of these, and I know we're, we're getting close to the to the end of our conversation, um, but a few things I just hit was developing that non-academic skills. There was one thing that jumped out. Oh, the N the um, NCCSD database. Do you like the, N NCS the NCCSD database? Is that accurate and up-to-date? Um. Nothing's really up to date. And what I mean right. is that um, it's extremely hard. Uh, they send out surveys just like, um, do you guys know, uh, we didn't even talk about the K&W guy. How did I not pull that out for this? So um, what is challenging, and I, I am working um, right now on a chapter of a subchapter of a textbook for people studying to be school counselors. And I was trying to gather resources for students with all different kinds of disabilities, not just learning disabilities. But frankly, they are the majority of the population at college. Um, it is what we call the highest incidence disability, learning disabilities. So right now, they're the only ones who get their own book. So you know about KW, right, Harlan? Yeah. So okay. the KW Guide to Colleges, right? Absolutely. So that's the, and you like you like this guide. So I think, and on my website, there is a um, an interview. There's part of the interview. The rest is in the book with Amy Wax, who's one of the co-authors. Um, there are limitations to what they can do and say also because, again, this has a couple of hundred 
um, colleges in it. So well, what you need to know is just because the college isn't in there doesn't mean they don't yeah. have accommodations. It's 4,000 right. colleges. And so it, NCSSD and, and K&W are sort of birds yeah. of a feather in that they the way they gather information is they send out um, surveys. Now, um, K&W only includes colleges that replied, and even then they still, yeah. you know, cut, 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 cut down to a certain number. NCSSD, I believe, it, it may be everybody, and some of that information may just be gathered from the office's page. So um, they, I had talked to them, and I think they're hoping to revise it. Um, it it's just another tool. Yeah, this is great. So here's what I'm thinking that we can. So I would love people to put questions in the comments wherever you see this. And what I'll do is I'll watch these comments and maybe even I'll just curate a list of questions that we can address in August to to just give people a, a perspective from someone who, you know, I, I really trust you. And you, you know not only about your personal experiences at your university, but also in terms of the research, the laws, the different, you know, the presenting, working with counselors. I think that would really be, I think it'd be really helpful. Would you be up for that? Absolutely. Any opportunity to answer people's questions, try to direct them to the right people if I can't, um, and let you know sort of the extent of what we know and, you know, represent the vast, the vast universe of things we don't know. Yeah, um, and I'm going to send you to put under this that list of the 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 other resources I was able to find, which were all online for a couple of different disabilities. Okay, so this is such a longer conversation, and the goal is to help students and parents to just understand different resources to get information that's going to hopefully alleviate a lot of the 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 anxiety by providing providing accurate information. Is there someone who's going to say, Elizabeth doesn't provide accurate information? Harlan, why do you think Elizabeth is, is providing it? I mean, is it like, does that happen to you? Um, it One time in a webinar, uh, a, a, a parent said, well, where do you work? And I said, I'm actually not allowed to share that. I am a consultant. And so I start my presentations by saying that I represent only myself and not that university and that right. person you know, was sort of, to, so you don't have to, um, call, don't take it from me, take it from a disability services office, call them. Right. Um, and I will also send you, let me make my list. Um, the, uh, the office for civil rights is the part of the department of, Ed, of education, U S department of education yeah. that oversees all of this stuff. And they have a couple of posts on their site, one, a letter, an open letter to parents, a, yeah. a guide for students, guide for educators. So you can see not all of these details, but a lot of what we've talked about reinforced there by the U.S. Department of Ed. That's great. Do you feel like there's anything that we should have touched on for a first conversation about this that we didn't that we didn't talk about? Um, let me lead with optimism. I meet so many wonderful, bright college students, graduate students. Um, from all different walks of life, and they are doing well. And those who are doing well are the ones who are utilizing their resources. Um, they are, again, going to class, doing the things they're supposed to, seeking help when they need it, and they're being successful. And so I appreciate it. And I wanted to just jump onto what you had just said, which was, as you know, like in the introduction and the end of this book, what I try to say to families is I, I may tell you some things that may make you anxious and make you feel uncomfortable. It is my hope that knowledge is power and that I've given you the information you need to, even whenever you're watching this, make sure your student has the right preparation. Um, you know, and and the overarching theme of that is their independence. The more independent we can make them, the more likely they are, in my opinion, to, you know, to be successful there. Um, they need the self-awareness yeah. too. Yeah. You know, I, I want to close with, with this with this thought. If if you're a student or a parent of a student and you don't want to you don't want to take advantage of these resources and, and, and you really have been successful and needed these resources, but they don't want to do it. They go, I'm gonna have a fresh start. You know, I don't want to do that. All the time. And and how do those students 
generally, I know it's a generalization, but like if a student doesn't want to take advantage of those resources, you know, what what's their outcome? <laughs> so here's what's so chug. You know, I, I got a nerd out on you again. Here's the thing. So when we have any research on students with disabilities at college, it's generally because the most rigorous is where they've registered with our office. Now, I've seen some studies where they'll take like the freshman psych, you know, whatever, intro to psych survey course of 200 students and ask them a bunch of, of questions. And some will self-identify and say, I have ADHD, for instance. But maybe they think that because they watched a bunch of TikToks on it. Please beware of TikTok diagnosis. <laughs> And information. I just saw a study that said how inaccurate, especially the stuff about uh, ADHD, is on TikTok. Yeah. And it's common aside. So um, let's see if I can, with my working memory, get back to where I was. So uh, the, the the right. How do we know how whether these students are successful? So we have one longitudinal study which showed that something like 76% of students who had had accommodations in high school did not register for them in college. Um, but it doesn't, it didn't go so far as to figure out how many of those graduated or didn't. Right. And so the problem with all of this is if students go to college, they don't register with us, we can't really count them as a student with a disability, like enough to know they're there and track them. Yeah. Because we can't make them register. So um, presumably, and, and look, anecdotally, I have met graduate students who have gone through college without using their accommodations. Um, sometimes they're really, they've found a college where, for instance, everything is papers and projects for the most part. They don't have to take a lot of exams. And so they just work really hard and really long. Yeah. And that's they graduate. Oh, that's a good that's a that's a great way to to close this out. Is that how you learn, and the ways you've really been able to thrive, are also questions to ask and things to look for because an environment that can kind of mirror where you've gotten comfortable and been able to utilize your strengths can certainly be a great place. Um, uh, I, I you asked me to a question, and I and I wanted to. I don't want to close this conversation without doing this. Please. One of the things he said was, what should students do before they go to college? And they must absolutely read this book, Outsmart Your Brain, Why Learning is Hard and How You Can Make It Easy. Um, Dr. Daniel Willingham is my professional idol. He also has a TikTok channel, which is awesome. So this is really, really digestible tips. Um, he's the one whose work my study strategies are based on. Um, this is a book you must read. And you, this one you have to read before college. Before college, you also have to read The Naked Roommate. Uh, <laughs> you must read The Naked Roommate. Oops, sorry. Um, this is all the non-academic and some academic stuff that you must know about. It just, I love Harlan. All of the, you talk about all the things most of us would forget to talk about and you normalize all of the stuff. I mean, this plus your videos are so, such good resources. And they don't have to read, but they must purchase and bring with them the Ultimate College Student Health Handbook. Um, I'd recommend reading it beforehand because of the really good information about alcohol and drugs wow. and sexually transmitted diseases that nobody wants to talk to you about that normalize everything, but also talk about how many people aren't doing certain things. Mm. Um, so I think these three together really are important. Oh, that's great. Well, thank you. I didn't know you were going to include me in in this company. So, um, oh, absolutely. Yeah, you know, I'm I'm always revising and updating. So, if there's things that you think everyone needs to hear, or the thing that you say again and again and again, and you're like, "Gosh, I just want people to know," or even me making a video, you know, like I I want to serve and I want to help and I want to be able to provide this you know this information. It's like it's so needed, and there's so few places to get it. It's so frustrating. Yeah. It, yes, I agree 100%. Yep. Yeah. Well, so yeah. I, this is great. I am so grateful for you and for the work you do and being a resource and being so generous with your time. Is there anything else that you wanted to include? I want to make sure that you have the space before we we do it to be continued. So again, the research shows us that a number of students don't register with our office when they get there. And it's that's okay. These are, again... 
it's the deliberate choices that they make that I think are, are really important. Yeah. This is how you grow up and become an adult, right? So, but what I would propose is that registering with our office is what I call a free insurance policy. So if you register with us and we prove your accommodations and you go to class and lucky you, college is easy. You are, you are better than I am. So you'd find that you don't need those accommodations. We don't make you use them. Nobody could, right? So nobody's going to force you to use more time on your exams or take it in the other room or if they provide you permission to record your lectures, make you do that. But if you don't register with us and as the first set of midterms approaches, you start to get that icky feeling in your stomach, we do not have to rush our process for you. So if you show up a week before your first exam, there's a pretty good chance at some colleges that you will not be accommodated for those exams. Doesn't mean you can't do it later. You always have the choice to register whenever you want. The point is we don't have to rush and there are no do-overs. So we don't drop your lowest grade because you came to us later. You know, this is adult life and you are considered responsible for those choices. So register. It can only help. Absolutely. I think that's wonderful. It doesn't impact anybody in any way other than if they need it, it's there. And yeah. th this is and this is what I was really getting at is the, the student who has thrived and been able to be successful with accommodations in high school, then they say, I'm going to college and I don't want these. And the parents like, no, you, you should take advantage of these. And exactly what you said of just, you just register so you have access because if you need it, it's there. And if you don't need it, then it doesn't even matter. Right? Right. It's just, right. and I think the maturity, there's that maturity of like recognizing that, which yeah. sometimes scares me of like, if someone's so determined to start over and abandon who they are and have a fresh start, I'm like, uh, you know, you are who you are and you're a beautiful human being and you've really thrived and you've had challenges, but to abandon who you are and think you're going to be able to start fresh isn't really a realistic expectation. So embrace who you are and take advantage of the people and places who can help you and support you so you can be as successful as you want to be. And it's not a pie. You using your accommodations doesn't take them away from somebody else. Um, you know, some of the research shows students feel guilty about it and that they shouldn't have it. Well, that's why we have eligibility decisions. Right, right. Well, this is great. All right, Elizabeth, uh, if people want to find you, how do they how do they find you? I am everywhere. So I'm, I am exhausted because I'm on basically all the social media channels. Um, I have a newsletter I send out just twice a month with some some good resources um, thank you. You can read my book. Um, Facebook is where I am primarily. I do talks there that eventually go to my YouTube channel. So um, you can find me. I'm, I'm lots of places. There's lots of free information on my site. If you don't want to read the book, that's fine. And you can watch the YouTube channel. Um, it, this is, you know, this is the thing I really care about. So I want it to be accessible to as many people as possible. I can tell, and this is Elizabeth's book, Seven Steps to College Success, A Pathway for Students with Disabilities. Um, so you gave me the book at NACAC. You gave me a copy, and here's what happened. My booth was so crazy busy, I left it next to me, and someone took it. So, <laughs> so I bought it. I bought oh, it. Oh, thank you. I would have sent you another one. Oh, no, I wouldn't have asked you, but I was so happy to buy it and support you, and I highly recommend that parents and professionals check this out. And I just want to say thank you, Elizabeth. And we will we will do this again soon. I really yeah. am grateful for you. Bye. And I am grateful for you too. If, I mean, if you've just found Harlan, uh, there is, there's just such a wealth of tips and empathy and just wonderful information on all of his channels. So please find him. It's oh, well, not all right. We'll have to include that in, in this podcast. We won't edit that part out. <laughs> no, I don't think you should. And people should read his book. You know, whenever anybody says anything, it's that whole imposter syndrome thing that we started with. I get like so uncomfortable um, because it's like, ugh, you know, I don't want people to, this is about you. It's not about me. But I know, but I, I, I am always looking to point people to really good resources. And so that's one of my favorite things to do is to connect them with, you know, smart, interesting people. Well, now people know you. Thanks, Thank Elizabeth. You. I appreciate it. Thank you, Harlan.